invite Dr. Atuldar for carrying the session forward. Uh, Dr. Atuldar. So thank you, Hardik. So we will begin this session number for this conference that is titled Fuels for Sustainable Transportation. And I am privileged to host very versatile and knowledgeable panel comprising of Dr. R.K. Malhotra, Dr. K.B. Misra, Dr. Professor Yogesh C. Sarma, Professor Ramesh Agarwal, and Professor Nirendra Mustafi. Here we promise to cover all aspects of the fuels for future transportation, all the way from the surface transport to the road transport and from the research perspective, starting from the production of the fuel to some aspects on their emissions as well as some causal effect why particular emissions are important. So we will begin this session with Dr. R.K. Malhotra and let me have this opportunity to briefly introduce Dr. R.K. Malhotra. So, by training, he is a mechanical engineer from IIT BHU and PhD in Energy Studies from IIT Delhi. Presently, he is the Director General of Federation of Indian Petroleum Industry. And before that, he was the board member of Indian Oil Corporation as Director R&D. And he was also responsible for that organization as chairman till June 2014. So he has vast experience related with the conventional as well as alternative fuel production. And he has also worked quite comprehensively in oil manufacturing industries. So I will request Dr. Alki Malhotra to start with wider perspective on current fuels as well as what is the future he say, sees for transportation fuels. Thank you, uh, Atul, for uh, kind introduction. Let me uh, say good evening to all the speakers, co-panelists, and uh, the audience. And I must also apologize that I will have to leave by 6.30. I have some commitment uh, which has uh, happened suddenly, which I cannot avoid. But I thought I will keep my commitment to speak in this session. I have no formal presentation to share with you. Uh, when I spoke to Avinash uh, Agarwal, uh, I told him that uh, that my age I, uh, and my responsibilities of job doesn't find me time to prepare a PPT kind of thing, but I can just uh, share some of my experiences, some of my thoughts on the uh, sustainable fuels. The topic is very pertinent and we have been talking about energy transition these days, you know, everybody is uh, talking about sustainability. Uh, when we are using uh, some of the fossil sources of energy, what will happen in the transition and how things uh, will go about. Let me uh, uh, state that uh, India is a developing country. We will continue to need uh, the uh, fuel, more of fuels, the growing economy, the more aspirations of the middle class growing middle class and uh, an appetite for energy will lead uh, to more consumption of fuels. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are also concerned about uh, global warming. Uh, the global temperatures have been rising and now the people were talking about two degrees, uh, you know, control and now 1.5 degrees is being talked about if we have to take care of the climate. So this is a great challenge for uh, companies uh, in our federation like oil and gas companies that they have to work towards sustainability while at the same time catering to the energy needs uh, of the society. So this uh, pandemic which is uh, ongoing has changed the way we operate, we work, uh, we conduct seminars, conferences, uh, as you see. You know, we are working from home, we are uh, having online classes, you guys in teaching uh, sector, 
and uh, also you know travel is reduced but still i can tell you the country like india uh, the refineries are not operating at almost 100% uh, the, the fuel demand is back uh, you know to the pre covid levels as far as the uh, motor gasoline and diesel is concerned uh, of course the aviation fuel is uh, a little low having said that uh, when we talk about uh, alternatives or, or how do we see things moving forward i think if we have to take uh, care of the uh, environment while catering to the energy needs the options are uh, you know uh, quite limited one thing which comes to mind is that the energy efficiency uh, which can certainly reduce the energy consumption as well as the emissions so if you reduce the energy consumption the emissions will go down so those involved in the internal combustion engines like professor avinash agarwal who is a good friend of mine at kanpur and others uh, also in the international arena uh, that uh, people talk about uh, improving efficiency of the internal combustion engines i think that's the way to go forward so you will reduce the emissions while you will also conserve the energy as far as india is concerned we have gone to euro 6 levels as far as the environment and pollution aspect is concerned we have gone to bs 6 levels straight from bs 4 Uh, in the april 2020 during this pandemic quietly we moved from bs4 to bs6 which is your 4 to euro 6 equivalent levels uh, as far as the uh, petrol and diesel quality is concerned so that will help us uh, in reducing the environmental pollution but as far as the co2 emissions are concerned they will not go down unless we improve the engine efficiencies other alternative is that we go to bio, uh, alternative fuels like biofuels Uh, the government has been laying a lot of emphasis on biofuels uh, ethanol and biodiesel biodiesel there was a strong momentum at one point of time but unfortunately sufficient supplies you know that time jetropa and, uh, and you know karanjia all were talked about but something has not happened around that but as far as ethanol is concerned for motor gasoline blending it has picked up quite a lot during last few years the the blending ratios have gone up now government is talking about 20% per blending of ethanol so ethanol coming from sugarcane molasses sugarcane juice etc is fine but at the same time we need to have ethanol from bio uh, you know 2g ethanol biomass uh, conversion you know which is the biomass which we have been burning so what we call is the second generation uh, 2g ethanol so oil companies are setting up plants for 2g ethanol there is a project which is being done by indian oil uh, when i was director of r&d on the board of iucc we had uh, had a collaboration with lanza tech for converting the waste refinery of stream gases to ethanol so i think those kind of projects are very important as far as the uh, other fuel is concerned the natural gas which we have been using which will also take care of the pollution the carbon uh, content in the methane uh, is only one carbon so as compared to other liquid fuels the the carbon content of the fuel goes down so carbon emissions reduce as well as you don't have particulate emissions when you use natural gas cng we are well aware that we have been using and uh, using efficiently in our engines now it is being talked for long distance transportation lng is being introduced uh, you know uh, only uh, about 10 days back the the first foundation stone for an lng station was put up by the minister of petroleum and uh, this will go in a big way the major corridors will have lng stations uh, the auto manufacturers are coming forward to uh, you know have the technology available for lng vehicles will be produced by them and uh, we are also talking about conversion of the existing uh, trucks you know to lng operation uh, lng uh, being cheaper than diesel it will save uh, the money for uh, the truck operators the transportation costs will come down Uh, and you will also reduce the pollution as well as the carbon emissions from such vehicles so by uh, on one hand we have improved the quality of petrol and diesel the second we are using biofuels extensively we are increasing biofuels we are looking for biomass conversion to ethanol for blending with motor gasoline we are using more of gas the cng uh, will be now coming in big way in all the cities and lng will also be there so these are the fossil fuels spreading wings 
and if the ic engine uh, developers or the scientists or professors uh, you know engaged in research and the tech and the, uh, the motor vehicle companies they improve the engine efficiency it will add to uh, you know the benefits of uh, reduced emissions having said that when we also uh, consider that what next the government has been talking about electric vehicles in a big way the uh, the niti aayog the policy making body of india has been stressing a lot of emphasis on electric vehicles they are saying that uh, at one stage they said all petrol and diesel vehicles will be banned by 2025 or 2030 or so on and so forth but later on realized that it is not possible uh to just ban the high sea engine because you need lot of charging infrastructure you need batteries and batteries uh, use you know uh, the materials which are not available in in the country so you are uh, when you are talking on one hand of atmanirbhar bharat the battery import of materials for batteries will continue to be imported so instead of importing oil you will be importing battery materials in the country and then uh, another issue which comes uh, to mind and which i have been talking to some of the uh, academicians also uh, is that uh, uh, whether the electric vehicles will solve the problem of carbon emissions which is the major problem india is a signatory for indc target in paris we have signed that our prime minister has signed the indc uh, commitment at paris cop 21 that we will reduce the uh, carbon emissions cut down on that but if we use to continue to use which we will uh, uh, to use the electricity from coal and if you use the coal based electricity to run your electric vehicles in a way you will be emitting more of carbon emissions than the petrol and diesel so is that the way we should go forward renewables will grow but renewables will not grow to that extent that it will stop the you know the coal based power generation in this country we are we are surplus in coal uh, we have to look for technologies which can uh, you know whether we can convert coal liquefaction coal to liquid fuels cleaner fuels or coal gasification route to produce fuels like hydrogen which can be used in ic engines or which can be used as a blending component for the natural gas or which can also be used in fuel cells should we not do that and if we produce hydrogen from from coal and you fix that carbon through the ccus route or you can convert that carbon to chemicals you can reduce your import dependence and you can have a step towards atmanirbhar bharat also which the the government intends other way is that biomass gas the hydrogen today can be most economically produced through biomass gasification we have lot of biomass you see lot of pollution in the northern cities particularly in delhi during winter when the biomass is burned you you get all the, you know the smog here and the, the, the pollution in delhi is is attributed to the burning of uh, of the biomass in the punjab and haryana now if all that can be collected perpetrated and you gasify it and convert it into uh, you know either you can use it as a uh, bio cng or bio you know bio compressed gas we have started talking about bcg you know you can convert waste also so waste disposal is a big problem burning of uh, biomass is a big problem in a agricultural dominant country like ours so can we uh, you know convert that into methane easily and then that methane can be compressed and blended with natural gas to reduce the import of natural gas in this country so these are some of the issues which will lead us uh, to several you know alternative fuels which will be used in future biofuels ethanol biodiesel if you can produce it from algae you can develop technologies from ethanol from waste gases Uh, from biomass then uh, then you are talking we are talking about hydrogen being produced from coal or also from biomass uh, you can always produce it from natural gas that's the most efficient way we do it in large quantities in our refineries i don't know uh, many of you may be knowing that the oil companies are the largest producers and consumers of hydrogen for hydrogen desulfurization etc to produce bs6 quality of fuels so we produce hydrogen in our refineries we can easily sell hydrogen and if hydrogen used in internal combustion engines you have some nox emissions and uh, you have uh, only water vapors coming out but if you use them in fuel cells you have no emissions 
So I think that's the way to go forward. A mix of all the fuels will be used in this country in time to come. You will not only use petrol and diesel for transportation purposes. You will use biofuels produced from sugar. You will produce biofuel from biomass. You will use hydrogen. You will use natural gas. You will use CNG, LNG, and biocompressed gas, and so on and so forth. And when we talk about electric vehicles or any any other alternative, if you are talking about sustainability, if you are talking about climate, I think we have to do the life cycle emissions. Uh, you know, measurement. The total life cycle uh, from the well to wheel, you have to see that. Even from people say that when you take out oil, etc., then whatever are the emissions, that also should be accounted. Battery manufacturing has a lot of emissions. Battery material disposal is a problem. So whether electric vehicles is a solution for meeting sustainability for transport, I have my doubts. So this is uh, for the academicians like you who have gathered here in this panel. This topic should be deliberated. I have requested a lot of academicians, including Professor Avinash Agarwal, that there should be a systematic study of the life cycle emissions. Uh, energy life cycle energy balance as well as the life cycle emissions for various kind of fuels which will be used in transportation to come to a conclusion that what's the best route for this country which is the way we should go about if we can produce hydrogen from natural gas and we can fix that carbon or convert that carbon to chemicals what's the problem we should do that we should continue to use fossil fuels ultimate aim is to reduce the carbon emissions to become a carbon zero carbon you know society which will take care of the of the atmosphere and which will also take care of the of the climate in time to come i think with these few words i think the time allocated to me is over if there are any yes, questions quick questions i will be happy to answer right now otherwise they can be read to me i'll be very happy to answer Thank you so much for giving this opportunity to share some of my thoughts. Uh, of course, I have not made a presentation, but I have shared whatever I want to say. Thanks. Thank you, sir. As an opening remark, nicely covering the entire scenario from improving current engines. I to think the Professor Ramesh Shagarwal wants yeah. to ask. So, a Professor Ramesh, please. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Malhotra, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for a very excellent insight and covering in a short time the whole scope of the biofuels and their impact and also talking about the climate and so on. I have two questions. Uh, yes. the one of them, you talked about the electric vehicles. and you So the main difference in using the electric vehicle is certainly, you know, you are going to, you know, have more emissions overall, if you consider that. But the the transportation, the, the the fuel is a moving fuel. So what happens is that the emissions, you cannot really control at a central point. Now in case of, say you have a power plant, so you have a emission controlled at the central point. So you can capture it and then you can maybe make chemicals out of this. And also you can probably sequester it underground or whatever the technology that may be. So that is the rationale behind electric vehicle that you can prevent the moving fuel, the moving uh, CO2 uh, instead of you know having a concentrated CO2. And the second question I have is related to the hydrogen. So the hydrogen, if you use the steam forming, it turns out that it generates a large amount of CO2. And then again, you will have to consider you know how to sequester it. So I think that the other alternative is to use electrolysis. And the electrolysis, you know, you can uh, achieve. It's a very expensive process. You have to have power for electrolysis. And one of the suggestions that is coming along is that if you use these is very small nuclear reactors, which are emission free, then that can be used for electrolysis of high, uh, and to obtain hydrogen from water. And then that can be used as a hydrogen. So hydrogen using steam forming, I think, is uh, going to generate a very large amount of CO2. Thank you very much for uh, listening to my questions. No, you you have uh, nailed it correctly. In the thermal power plants, where we produce electricity, 
you know the precipitators etc to control all kind of pollution that are available but co2 is definitely when you generate steam in the boilers or in thermal power plants the co2 is getting emitted capturing if we start capturing that co2 over there i think it's perfect there is no problem and then use that electricity in your vehicles that also is not a problem but it is not easy it is much easy is in the natural gas reforming when you have co2 you are right that when you reform natural gas there is a co2 emission controlling that co2 is much more easier than in a thermal plant of that size you know you can have reformers and you know you will be uh, uh, let me tell you that uh, the uh, mr mukesh ammani who runs the largest refinery in india he has gone on record to say that his refinery will become a zero carbon refinery by 2035 you know how is he going to do it by 2050 people are talking in europe he says by 2035 they have the technologies and technologies are being developed whatever carbon during that refining processes or reforming they produce a lot of hydrogen they they have petrol pet petrol gasification units also so whatever co2 is emitted that will be converted into useful chemicals when we have started talking about circular economy so those are the things which are much easier if we can someone can do it in a thermal power plant you have uh, nailed it correctly but i personally feel that is much more easy to control co2 in natural gas reforming than in the coal for coal we have taken up the projects in this country to convert coal into methanol you know there's a uh, the niti ayog has been laying emphasis uh, to convert coal to methanol uh met uh, coal gasification and you can always convert it into uh, after coal gasification you can convert it to methanol or you can that same gas you can easily uh, control to methanol or to hydrogen and then you can capture co2 also i think that it is much more easier in coal gasification route to control co2 rather than in the thermal plant so having said that uh, there could be technologies developed in future to control uh, or capture co2 in thermal power plants i don't know but right now countries like china are doing big you know coal gasification for to produce hydrogen and capturing co2 adds to the cost so uh, right now we are talking about brown hydrogen uh, because when you use hydrogen more efficiently in fuel cells you have better efficiency you re you reduce the energy consumption in a way because of the higher efficiency of fuel cells now coming on to hydrogen you are right that you have to like it electrolysis is a good route for for renewable energy yes when you have renewable energy a lot of solar energy hydrogen becomes an energy storage system also because you uh, otherwise you would need large batteries to store yeah. power or solar power so that renewable power can always be combined so uh, electrolyzer efficiencies are improving day by day in future people are talking of high efficient uh, solar uh, oxide electrolyzer cells soec or sofc reversible so you can uh, you know uh, produce uh, uh, hydrogen through the soec and then use that in sofc to produce back power so those technologies have been developed in india also soec and SO there is a company in india in pune which is uh, which is doing that so i think uh, the things are moving and uh, let's hope that uh, the cleaner transport uh, will be there and uh, hydrogen fuel cells uh, will also be equally clean to electric vehicles no pollution on the streets but bs6 also is reasonably you know if you have all fleet converted to bs6 or running on natural gas you have quite clean you know the the contribution of automobiles to the overall air pollution is hardly anything in india you know it is a misconcept that all pollution is being caused by vehicles only for roads so i think uh, that's why the the quantification of pollutant the the you know uh, which source apportionment studies and those kind of things should be done by the academicians uh, life cycle emissions source apportionment studies that which is the major source of pollution iit kanpur uh, there is a professor mukesh sharma i think who has been doing a lot of work on that source apportionment and he had concluded that automobiles contribute to about 20 25% of pollution in the cities and that the uh, report was based when the even bs4 vehicles were not there now we have gone to bs6 which is a significant reduction you know uh, in emissions so uh, we need to modernize our fleets we need to move to cng or lng and uh, 
you know, HCNG also has been introduced in Delhi. We have done some work in IUC, which is now being implemented. So I think uh, these are the ways to... Sir, uh, and as I I said, it will be mixed up. Concluding question. Okay. So we want to listen your views on future of hydrocarbon economy. So this is the... Pardon? So you can conclude your view on future of hydrocarbon economy. Hydrocarbon economy or hydrogen economy? Hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbon to hai na, yaar. Hydrocarbon to sare fuels hai How na. it will phase out? No, no. You, you will, it will not phase out that easily. By, by not before 2050, you will continue to use hydrocarbons, you know. Abhi itna jaldi khatam nahi hone wala hai. Don't worry about that, you know. <laughs> People's prediction is that uh, uh, hydrogen economy will ultimately replace the hydrocarbon economy, but uh, it will take time, you know. Okay? We'll ultimately move to hydrogen economy, I'm sure about it which will be carbon-free economy, but not before 2050. Okay? Okay. So, so thank, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, I've taken a lot of time during this discussion, but I tried to. Okay? So if any yeah. further questions are there, please write to me. I'll be very happy to answer those. Okay, okay sir. I will route those thank questions you. to you. Thank and you. Thank you for starting on a very comprehensive Thank note. you. I'm, I'm sorry I have to leave now. Okay? Thanks. So now we will move to Professor Kirti Bhushan Misra. So he is currently teaching at IIT Roorkee related to the combustion and emissions. And he has done MTech from MNIT Bhopal and B from RGPV Bhopal. And his current area of research is combustion and fuels, fire safety, explosions, disaster management, their modeling and prevention approaches. So today he has agreed to give a comprehensive overview of emission measurement techniques for various alternative fuels. So now I request Professor Kirti Bhushan Misra to continue his talk, please sir. Thank you very much Dr. Atuldar for the very nice introduction. I hope I am audible to all. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, would you please allow me to share my screen so that I can, you know, share my presentation because it consists of uh, three, four videos, which would be nice to uh, show to the audience to have an idea about what we do. Uh, sir, you can say, start sharing, sir. We have enabled that. Is the slide visible to all? Yes, sir. Slide is visible. And... Okay. All right. So I will directly come to the point and uh, will be putting everything into perspective with the title of my talk. It's on measuring emission by alternative fuel blends of biodiesel, methanol, ethanol, and DTBP in laboratory scale diesel engines. So why it is required to measure emission correctly? Because we just cannot go ahead and put biodiesel in our existing engine and start running it. So we have to look carefully what kind of performance they are delivering and are they meeting the emission norms, which we just talked about before my presentation. So uh, all these things are generally done for the small scale laboratory engine in the, in the institute. And from there, we scale it up to heavy duty engines. Once we have, you know, number of good quality data sets, then we can say something precisely that yes, this fuel blend is uh, good for the existing engines and we can use it as per our uh, expectations by the standards. Whether it's an Indian standard or international standard, it has to be, uh, first of all, measured and approved by the standard laboratories. So we have started um, these measurements for different fuel blends in order to develop some sort of idea about what can be the right proportion of different uh, constituents in, a, in an ideal fuel. So why we do this? We have learned from the report from National Green Tribunal that uh, the major cause of pollution in New Delhi 
comes from the transport sector and this transport sector utilize heavy duty trucks two wheelers and passenger cars out of this three trucks emit about 24% two wheelers about 18% followed by passenger car which emit about 15% major constituent of pollution we generally know them from our existing knowledge that they are particulate matter of the size 2.5 micrometer which easily go inside our lungs when we breathe SO2, sulfur dioxide, and NOx, NONO2. So out of this, the NOx 53% and PM2.17%, these two cause a lot of troubles. And they are required to be measured in the laboratory for different fuel blends so that we can avoid this major part of pollution which generally come from the transport sector. On one side, we have to reduce pollution. And another side, we have to also look for the environmental aspect. So meeting both the things will require a discovery of new uh, or alternative fuel. You can go and use your plants to produce biodiesel, which is renewable, and use it in the existing engine without any major design modification. So what happens when we uh, produce biodiesel from the plant and take it to the refilling station, fill it in the car, it starts giving trouble in terms of engine efficiency and the pollution. Okay, so we have this uh, speculations that uh, the green fuels will produce less emission and will maintain the desired output. So, which is uh, not generally true. Many people have conducted experiments, researched on different, different kinds of engines, and they found that there still requires some modification in the fuel so that it can be replaced uh, in, the, in the existing engines. So there are literature which suggests that we can go ahead and use some uh, alcohol-based fuels like methanol, ethanol in different proportion in biodiesel and reduce the carbon monoxide, unburnt hydrocarbon and NOx to some percentage. There are many studies available in the literature which also suggest that you can use little bit of C10 improvers and one such study conducted by us recently and it has been published so that C10 improver will basically help you to reduce the ignition delay and improve the quality of combustion inside the engine by reducing the residence time of reacting elements. So our objective is uh, quite simple that we want to find out the right proportion of uh, fuel to maintain the same output and cut down the emission without changing any engine design. The fuels which we have selected for this particular study are diesel, biodiesel, methanol, ethanol, and one C10 improver that is DTBP. So our focus will be mainly on whether Ethanol addition or methanol addition in biodiesel together with DDBP delivers the maximum desired output or we have to do something else with the fuel. So why we are doing these things? Because these three all are renewables, biodiesel, methanol, ethanol. But when we take some proportion of these two fuels or these three fuels, then what we see is that the combustion efficiency is not improving that much. So it requires a little bit of improvement in the, in the quality of combustion. Therefore, we have to go for a C10 improver. So that C10 improver is DTBP. It's dietered butyl peroxide. It's, it has a flash point much lower than the other fuels. So it uh, burns quickly, which we will be seeing in the next slide here. So uh, DTBP has uh, 
a symmetric chemical structure and both sides are connected by two oxygen atoms. When you add this uh, fuel DTBP in a uh, small quantity, let's say 1.6% in biodiesel, then you see that all the emissions are reducing by significant margin. Okay, so uh, this addition of a small quantity in biodiesel has motivated us to make the existing blend a little bit more oxygenated in nature by adding ethanol and methanol. And let's see what happens then. So here, what I'm going to show you is the way we start our research on using fuel in engines. So we have a small scale pool fire experimental setup in the lab. So we burn the different fuels in different diameter pans in the laboratory, and we see how the diff their diffusion flames look like. So what you see here is the small flames produced by diesel, biodiesel, ethanol, and methanol. So methanol flame is almost invisible, but if you increase or uh, if you go towards uh, higher chain hydrocarbon, ethanol, biodiesel, and diesel, then the flames become more and more visible. So why we carry out this study is to know the fundamental properties of diffusion flame under ambient conditions. Okay, once we have these parameters, then we can at least have an idea about uh, what to mix in which uh, quantities. So that, that forms basically a basis to go ahead and uh, select the right proportion for blending. Now, in this video, what I'm trying to show you is how fast the C10 improver, that is DTBP, burns in the same size of pan. On the right side, you see the diesel fuel that is burning very slowly, producing a very small flame. And on the right hand side, you see a flame produced by nitrate butyl peroxide, and it is almost three to four times larger in length. So it burns quickly and helps the other longer hydrocarbon chain fuels to uh, mix and burn efficiently. Uh, this uh, fuel addition in the conventional fuel like diesel, petrol, and biodiesel have been patented by us uh, during my work as a uh, PhD and postdoc, uh, postdoctoral candidate in Germany. So uh, they are quite efficient. They have complete list of different uh, kinds of uh, peroxides and uh, depending on our requirement we can pick up one particular uh, peroxide and aid them in different proportion in ethanol methanol together with biodiesel or any other uh, biodiesel which are produced by different fed stocks so we have selected uh, the biodiesel, which is produced by waste cooking oil, and we have added ethanol and dietary butyl peroxide in 5 to 10% ethanol and 1 to 2% of peroxide. Also, we have added a little bit of methanol, which, uh, uh, which does not give us the required performance. But yes, we have the data set to say that addition of methanol can also make sense. But ethanol addition is much more efficient than the methanol one. We have uh, a laboratory scale test engine uh, of uh, four kilowatt capacity, 611 single cylinder uh, diesel engine. And here we uh, have a fixed comp compression ratio and we can use it to uh, measure the performance as well as emission characteristics of different fuel blends. So these are all showing the engine parts and the control unit, fuel tanks, and display of emission. We can all collect the data directly on computer and process it from there. I've just talked about the engine specification, so I will not repeat it. I will directly uh, go to the uh, results. So 13 so minutes. We, how much time do I have? Uh, about two minutes, sir. Two minutes. So uh, NOx was found to be reduced by 10% when we add DTBP alone. 
carbon monoxide got reduced in uh, ethanol blended fuel by 30 to 40 percent then in a case of methanol in different proportion is my slide visible dr atul no content is not visible sir yeah i think there are some slides issues. are visible but content we can't see can you just uh, share the pdf from your side because i i think uh, here also I, i'm having some issue can you just share the pdf from there okay so then please yeah, stop sharing yeah, yeah okay. i'm stopping it here yeah, yeah. Okay. So good thing was while videos were being presented, it worked. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. <laughs> okay. Sometimes it's uh, not known. The reasons are not known. But sir, it's a very good insight into the work. Sir. Uh, Yes, we uh, did this work in the last year. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, we found out that uh, this kind of studies are required because biodiesel alone is not that efficient it, uh, uh, as it appears to be. Absolutely, absolutely. So along with DTB, there are other C10 improvers as well? Yes, yes. I have shown you the complete list of uh, those uh, C10 improvers, okay. uh, which I, some of which I have also investigated in my uh, work in PhD and postdoc. Mm -hmm. Is it uh, working, mm -hmm. Dr. Dhar? So Akhilendri is uh, trying to share. Or, or I, I will try to share the screen from here, uh, the PDF one. Sir, we are sharing, sir. Just a second. Okay. Okay. Fine. Okay. So in the meantime, I can uh, tell you something about what you uh, would see in the slide. Uh, most of the emissions like uh, unburned hydrocarbon, smoke, NOx, and uh, um, uh, the, the other uh, emissions, they have been cut down drastically when we aid the same proportion of dietary butyl peroxide in biodiesel ethanol blends. Methanol blends did not give yeah. us that kind of output. So, sir, now the slides are visible. So, okay. Uh, so, please, please this is exactly me. what I was talking about. Yes, yeah. So, uh, adding DTBP in ethanol biodiesel blends made us a uh, little bit more uh, uh, convinced that uh, we are getting significant reduction in the emission. So next, please. Dr. Dhar, can you scroll the slides? Can you go to the next one? Yeah. So this is about hydrocarbons. Yeah. Yeah. This is also I have talked, so you can directly go to the conclusion part. Yeah, this is also I have talked. Okay. Yes. 
So here, it, uh, previous one, please. Yes, uh, in this table, you can uh, see the summary of the results that we have collected from out of our test. So uh, the combination of biodiesel 93%, DTBP 1.8% in ethanol about uh, 5%, that blend has given us the optimum performance by reducing the NOx by 6.3%, CO by 52%, HC by 49% and smoke by 45%, maintaining the same output of engine, which is four kilowatt. At the same time, methanol blend gave us the more or less same reduction in NOx, but the other uh, reduction were not comparable to what the ethanol blend gave. So we uh, propose to use uh, the ethanol DTBP biodiesel blends to meet the emission norms and before we say something very precisely, we are planning to conduct these experiments on heavy, heavy duty engines so that we have uh, will have some good quality data sets to say something precisely about what will happen on the road. Next, please. So what I have shown you is that uh, the ethanol, DTBP, and biodiesel blends are uh, most preferred ones. And once we have uh, uh, started producing those uh, kind of data that are required to uh, to get, you know, uh, acceptance uh, by the authorities, we will be uh, able to show that uh, yes, the C10 improver is required in any case to be aided in biodiesel in order to meet the desired engine efficiency and emission norms. Next, please. So these are the references that I have uh, chosen for the work. And uh, as I said, uh, our future work will be to use the blends in heavy duty engines. With this, I would like to thank you very much for the kind attention. And uh, I'm very sorry for the inconvenience that has been caused because of the you know, a sharing problem of the slides. So now I am open uh, for the questions or we can take the questions at the end when all the- Questions we will take at the end and the final will respond on the, all the questions all right. collectively. Okay. All right, thanks so, a lot. Thank you, Professor Misra. And we are running seven minutes late <laughs> and we will try I'm to catch up that. Sir. And no, it was not your fault, sir. But, yeah. And now we have uh, Professor Yogesh C. Sarma from IIT BHU who will share us something on fuel production perspective. So Professor Sarma is currently working as professor in Department of Chem Chemistry at IIT BHU. He has done doctorate of science from CCS University, Merit, and his research interests are nanoabsorbent synthesis and characterization of various water remediation techniques, green chemistry, and production of various types of catalyst for fuel production. So I, now I request Professor Sarma to start his talk. Thank you, Atul. Thank you very much. So, sir, I will remind you at 12 minutes. Uh, five minutes. Yeah. Okay, no problem. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Agrawal that I'm exposed to such a galaxy of learned people in front of me. Uh, like it would have been wonderful if uh, we would have been interacting offline in some of the conferences. Maybe time permits, we'll uh, join somewhere. So can I Atul, um, share my presentation? Yes, sir, please. Uh, can you see this? Yeah. So please make it full screen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, sir, it is visible, okay. please. Okay. Oh, well, yeah. uh, told several things like nano adjournments and uh, whatnot. But then my current focus is on uh, synthesis and characterization of biodiesel. So I'm so happy that uh, we are speaker. Dr. Malhotra also touched this uh, biofuel and biodiesel 
And then uh, the learned professor K.V. Misra also spoke about it. I'm so happy about it. So what, what I do basically is biodiesel production. I have done some work. Uh, I mean, I don't say great work, but some work I have done. And I understand that can be a future fuel. So, so this is like scenario, uh, biodiesel cycle, how we get biodiesel. And then if we look at the global uh, energy consumption from various non-renewable sources, we get uh, all these petroleum products, net export are 2017 becomes natural gas, net, net uh, export are 2020 pandemic leads to market. Uh, transitions it's regarding oil it's taken from here, that is uh, energy agency. International energy consumption energy scenario by 2050 reflects that uh, by 2050 we would require much more amount of energy. These are uh, projections. History we uh, required less amount of energy, but with uh, time. Uh, development energy is needed for uh, practically for all applications. If you look at the present scenario, it is uh, India is third largest consumer of oil in the world behind US and China, third largest importer of crude oil. Production, it produces 0.9% of world oil and consumes 4.5% of the world oil. Consumption of oil in India grew by 8.1% compared to world growth of 1.9% in 2015. It, it is basically because of development and then requirement in all the sectors, including transportation sector. This is like we can see uh, the, the data. Oil, coal, like uh, percentage of total energy consumption from different sources in India. Still, we have uh, coal as the largest uh, uh, like, uh, material to uh, contribute to our energy production. The share of uh, uh, energy production from different sources. And we see that it is basically coal, which is largest, and then oil, 33%. Yeah, oil, 33%, coal is 30% and then 24% in natural gas, all from fossil sources. This energy demand of uh, transportation fuel in India. We can see the growth of uh, number of registered vehicles. It is enormous. The, the graph shows an upward trend. In 2004, uh, diesel motor gasoline represented 90% of uh, final energy consumed in transport sector. Diesel is the most used form of energy material uh, with a share of 66%. So, biodiesel. Biodiesel, is it a, like, uh, is it a solution? Is it an alternative to the fuels which are using? Or can it uh, replace uh, the existing uh, thermal power plant based fuels? So it is a non-petroleum based diesel fuel derived from renewable sources. So all of us know about it. Uh, speakers discuss about this, but then chemically biodiesel is a mixture of uh, saturated and unsaturated monoalkyl fatty acid acids. Alternative of petrodiesel and non-hazardous eco-friendly. This is like how uh, biodiesel is produced. I think uh, it is not interest of the audience. So I skip this slide. It's a simple uh, method. Like there are several methods through which we can uh, produce biodiesel from uh, feedstock materials, edible oils or non-edible oils, or for that sake, microalgae as well. But then the simplest method and through which we can have the best quality biodiesel is uh, process certification. There we require methanol, we require a feedstock, we require methanol. Basically, these two things we require, but then to uh, have a good production and in the last time we add a catalyst as well. So importance of biodiesel is a greener fuel, reduction of greenhouse gases, security of energy supply to promote a greater use of renewable energy, 
diversify agriculture economics into the market to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and to reduce the extent of import importing oil from uh, the countries this is relative emission uh, of diesels and diesel and biodiesel uh, if we look at the emissions we find that the biodiesel has minimum uh, amount of emissions it has emissions uh, professor mishra also pointed out it has emissions but the emissions are minimum if we compare it with the existing fuels the process of making biodiesel occurs as follows well. simple i just uh, don't focus on the slides trans certification which which i focus in my laboratory the triglycerides methanol catalyst are placed in, in a reactor and then trans certification is carried out initial product is placed in a separator to remove glycerin by product this glycerin is a very important by product and it can be used for uh, as such it can be used in pharmaceutical industries but there is another compound glycerol carbonate which is very expensive compound that is uh, another area of my research that is that can also be produced using this glycerin which we get out of uh, biodiesel transesterification by product the final biodiesel is rinsed with water and ph neutralization this biodiesel production via transesterification simple process two step only two step process these are the sources uh, jetrofa very very much talked about material jetrofa so vegetable oils like uh, edible oils are all can also be used but india is a net exporter of edible oils so we focus on non edible oils and then uh, not very new but uh, very important uh, feed stock material for biodiesel production is uh, this cooking oil this is uh, feed stock and then yield if you can see that uh, there are many uh, uh, feed stock materials say for example sunflower oil uh, canola or, or for that say camelina oil which give uh, yield of biodiesel as high as 95.8 to 99% so it is quite uh, high uh, yield and uh, animal fats can also be uh, already reported for biodiesel production waste cooking oil is another uh, very good material uh, which can like uh, which can be used uh, effectively to produce biodiesel waste cooking oil when i started looking at the literature long back like 2 3 years back i found that what is this waste cooking oil basically like uh, the residual oil after cooking which we we use no in most of the house and we use it but that is not to be used because of its corrosive nature it uh, contains uh, acids and acids are always corrosive so uh, it's very important and uh, like uh, available in large quantity material if you look at edible oils not very available in our country we are short of edible oils even non edible oils like uh, they work as uh, materials for uh, in drug industries they have very good uh, characteristics uh, medicinal characteristics so the supply is also not uh, very large so waste cooking oil has been used population is increasing consumption of oil is increasing that is edible oil is increasing and then uh, we can certainly go for uh, waste cooking oil as one of the important feed stock material for biodiesel production this is world biodiesel production we can see that indonesia such a small country followed by united states brazil germany argentina france spain all these entire uh, list of countries is uh, focusing on biodiesel because of uh, its cheaper fuel cheaper because uh, if you got uh, feed stock material at a small price lesser price than uh, total production cost of biodiesel is not very high biodiesel consumption see consumption united states largest consumer of biodiesel indonesia brazil thailand and then we are also somewhere at number 13 we are there we, we use very small amount of biodiesel and then if you look at the biodiesel policy of government of india then we were supposed to have like 20% of uh, blending of biodiesel with diesel 
but then uh, professor malhotra pointed out very correctly that uh, its supply is not there that is manufacture is not there more so it is not cost effective in our country and then uh, i think all of us know that uh, only rajdhani expresses are uh, running on b20 it is because we don't have enough uh, quantity of biodiesel to uh, blend the entire uh, diesel which is being used uh, in transportation sector that mm. 12 minutes biodiesel consumption and production over the years no this slide shows we are increasing uh, production of biodiesel is a very good trend and then application of biodiesel see this is latest like i would like to quote it i quote it in my presentations that 27th august 2018 the spice just flight it was partially powered by the trofa plant seed oil biodiesel from dehradun to delhi and then karnataka stc buses are using biodiesel under an experiment by bangalore agriculture university so it is like in, it's coming in practice if its production is uh, sufficient uh, it, it's a future fuel problems there are several problems you know but these problems can be set right the ability to produce and store biodiesel on a large scale few engines which can run on b100 biodiesel is not much suitable for extremely cold regions because of cold properties it is a comparatively new fuel there is a lack of uh, the lack of lot of work you now and funding as well um, from government side technological challenges are expensive feed stocks and inefficient production methods strict standards uh, for product quality nox emissions transportation and storage concerns are there these things are done then uh, biodiesel could be a better fuel biodiesel should be stored at the uh, 5 to 10 degrees uh, above cloud point above ground fuel systems should be protected with insulation agitation heating systems or other measures this is economics now there is ample room for improvement in efficiency of processing biodiesel development of a continuous transfer certification it is available but uh, it, it has to like it has to be further tested and uh, put for large scale biodiesel production and recovery of high quality glycerol that is another uh, like boosting the economy of biodiesel because from glycerol we go for production of uh, uh, glycerol carbonate so my dear uh, learned friends this is what i wanted to convey but then uh, like it yeah. is not biodiesel only like it is not biodiesel only uh, which can which can serve the purpose it it can be it can be hybrid of the hybrid of the fuels it could be clubbed with cng it could be clubbed with ethanol png it could be clubbed with the existing uh, system which we are already using so, so this is what professor sharma so that what? bigger perspective we will continue discussing in sure. in our question and answer session sure. thank you sir so now we can move on to aviation fuels by professor ramesh agarwal so he is currently professor at washington university after finishing his phd way back in 1975 from stanford university and his areas of interest includes ground effect aerodynamics flow control rarefied gas dynamics and hypersonic flows biofluid dynamics wind energy energy efficiency of buildings chemical looping combustion and geological carbon sequestration so i will request professor agarwal agarwal to start his talk related with aviation fuels sir so sir please unmute your mic so so slides are visible please unmute
Okay. Can you see the slides? Yes, sir. All right. Very good. So again, uh, good evening, everyone. And I really enjoy the previous presentations and they all address the ground transportation and the ground transportation certainly is a major area of interest all around the world. So currently we have about 300 million ground vehicles and they are supposed to increase to close to about 500 million in a matter of about eight to 10 years. So certainly the emissions from ground vehicles and the fuels that can reduce those emissions and can improve the efficiency is a very, very important topic. So I will change the gear and talk about what are the scenarios for the aviation. Now, we all know that the travel through air has increased substantially in last decade and particularly more people are flying in China and India. And so there is a forecast that the need for the aircraft will almost double in another about two decades. And so right now there are about 600,000 aircraft, including the military aircraft. And so they will double to about 1 million or more because there is a demand for air transportation particularly because of the growth in GDP and as well as the ability of people to fly. And so I think that the air transportation and the emissions will become a very important factor in the future. Now, currently the scenario is that only 2% of the emissions are being emitted by the air transportation. But it is forecasted that by the year 2050, it may increase to about 5%. Now, one of the effects of the emissions using the current jet fuel is that those emissions that are emitted at a level of about 25 to 50,000 feet above the ground, the CO2 emissions are about three times more effective in polluting the atmosphere compared to the ground vehicles. So if you have a emission, say 2% emissions, at a level of about 30,000 feet, it is equal to about 6% of the emissions which are emitted by the ground vehicles because of the effect of a higher level of atmospheric emissions and the way the CO2 interacts at a high altitude. So this impact is very important. And as I said, because of the growth in the air travel, uh, this has become a very important topic with the aviation industry and also the airlines, as well as the government all around the world. So several years ago, NASA and AKR in Europe, they put together a list of items that can help in the energy optimization of the air vehicles, and also the reduction in greenhouse emissions and the reduction in noise. So it's a long list. But you can see here that in terms of the in reduction in energy requirement, one of the ideas is to reduce the weight and by using the advanced composites, then coming up with the innovative aircraft designs, innovative engine designs, and also the next generation air traffic management, which is a very, very important topic because the way the aircrafts are routed, they can also influence substantially the energy consumption and as well as the emissions and also the change in aircraft operations and so on. So I have worked in many of these areas, but uh, you know the focus here is on the fuels. So the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions is two ways. One is the alternative fuels, which have been talked about by the previous speakers. And one of them is of course biofuels. And in biofuel, bioethanol is one of the more prevalent one and not the biodiesel. And the synthetic kerosene is the other one because they, are, have, they have to be jet fuels, which are slightly different than the regular gasoline. Now, futuristic fuels are the liquid natural gas, the hydrogen, and the batteries and fuel cells, which are also operated by the hydrogen. So my, I really do not work in the area of analysis of any of these fuels. My main interest is that how these fuels can be used in terms of the design of aircraft, 
so that they are energy optimized and what are the changes that we will require in the current aircraft configurations and as well as the current engines to have these fuels feasible. So those are very, very important uh, considerations because as you know, if you have to launch a new aircraft, a commercial aircraft, say about 300 passengers, you have to have invest in, investment about $20 billion. So there are hardly any companies that are in a position to take care of that kind of investment. So that is why the European consortium for the Airbus and also the other consortium that are being thought about are necessary in which the governments can invest that level of money. So this is a chart which basically shows that the key drivers for emission reductions. And I mentioned some of the technologies which are called the environmentally responsible aviation technologies, which included all kinds of weight reduction technologies and also the aerodynamic design technologies and then the aerospace technology, and that is the movement of navigation and the aircraft in the atmosphere, that is a very important part. But as you can see in reduction of the emissions, the alternative fuel technology is one of the most critical element. So here I'm showing you some of the aircraft that most of have flown and they will remain. They will remain and they will not be decommissioned because a lot of investment has gone into these aircraft and they will be around for an, at least another 50 years in the phasing these aircrafts where the investment has been already made in hundreds of billions of dollars is very difficult. And also, you know, they can fly cross Atlantic and they are a long haul aircraft, but the fuel efficiency of these aircrafts has also been, has been outstanding. So if you look at the 787 Dreamliner, then you know that the fuel efficiency compared to the 707 which came into being in about early 70s has at least improved by 80%. And once you improve the fuel efficiency, then of course you know that the emissions will go down. And this is the point that Dr. Malhotra also made. So as a result of that, you know, you have to see that how you can basically energy optimize these aircraft. So as you can see that the Boeing 787, Airbus 380, they are more energy optimized because they are aerodynamically more efficient with a higher lift to drag ratio and as well as they are made of a lot of parts of these aircraft are made of composite materials which are low weight and high life cycle materials. So now what NASA did is that about five years ago they said that let us use the technologies that are feasible other than the fuel technology and so see that what are the configurations that are feasible to make them energy optimized. So they came up with these five configurations which are now being investigated at a prototype stage by five different companies which are listed here. And so these configurations have been already designed and they are in a phase of basically investigating, in being investigated more. And after that, some experiments will be done. And finally, there will be some prototype will be made and then a particular aircraft may be picked out of these to see that whether it is possible to launch it and whether there is any airframe manufacturer is willing to do that along with the engine companies. But this research program has been a very, very important research program. And I have listed the aircraft which are being investigated by these five organizations. So I have played a small role in terms of the development of one of the uh, aircraft listed here and which is by Boeing because I live in St. Louis and I have worked for Boeing before. So now there is a evolution of aircraft engines. So there have been turbojets in the past many, many years ago, but now most of the aircraft engines are turbofans. And the key feature is that they are high, high bypass gear turbofans because they have a very high efficiency. So when I mentioned that from 707 to 787, uh, there has been a tremendous uh, improvement in the efficiency. It is because the, the change in the efficiency from turbojet to the high bypass gear turbofan. So now one of the things is that if these can use the jet fuel, but also the blend fuels. So what are the alternate fuels available? So one of them is of course biofuels and primarily bioethanol. And we have, and people have investigated both the meat and blended. The other one is of course LNG, but there is no aircraft flying today that uses LNG. Now there is a hydrogen that is, uh, and as mentioned, uh, you know, very vividly by uh, Dr. Malhotra, and I will talk about it, but there is no, even a short haul air, uh, aircraft, 
but they arrive in some recent aircraft that, that have been developed by using hydrogen. And there are certain major issues with that. Then, of course, they are a blend of hydrogen and biofuels and LNG. And this topic was also mentioned in the context of the ground transportation by Dr. Malhotra. And then batteries and fuel cells. And there are a lot of issues with the batteries. Of course, charging is one of the issues, but that is not a real problem. But the weight of the batteries and the distance they can cover is a very major issue for the air transportation. And fuel cells, of course, require hydrogen. And again, the energy efficiency that is required for even a 100 passenger aircraft to go about 300 miles is, is very large. So those are the critical issues that are there in the case of the air transportation. So what you can see here, this is a very busy slide, but one of the characteristics is very important in case of the aircraft fuels is that they, that they should behave like a drop-in fuel. Drop-in fuel means that the current fuel jet, which are jet fuels, they should have all the properties of a drop-in fuel. So that is the terminology that is being used. Now, many first-generation biofuels that were uh, created and they were tried in some aircraft and but they were they have performed poorly but now a next generation of biofuels i think they seem to have shown tremendous potential so the bio derived synthetic paraffin like kerosene bio spk is considered to be the most promising drop in fuel today in the foreseeable future to reduce co2 emissions and they have been tried and they can also reduce the radiative forcing now i saw a slide by dr yogesh and that mentioned but there was a flight uh, by spice jet that used a biofuel, uh, I think from Dehradun to Delhi, if I am correct. Now, this is a key biofuel, and that is, again, based on a variety of bi uh, ethanols. And so what you see here is that there are these properties that are very important uh, for the aircraft since they fly at a very high altitude, and you don't want your fuel to, uh, fuel to freeze. So one of the properties is freezing point. So what is the freezing point of a current jet fuel? And then the thermal stability of the fuel is very important. The viscosity is not that important, but it's still very important. And you don't want contaminants. And then, of course, the net heat of combustion is very important because you want to really utilize that energy fast and also over a longer distance. So if you compare the next column, this shows the properties of jet. And then the Air New Zealand, they've used the JetRofa uh, uh, based uh, bioethanol and to see what kind of properties they could have. And then the Continent Airline used the Jetrofa and LG combination and the Japan Airline used the Jetrofa, LG and Camelina contributions. And there has been a very careful um, uh, emphasis that we don't use any kind of uh, content biomass that can be used for food consumption because that is not a desirable thing to do. But in these cases, you know, Jetrofa, LG, and Camelina, you know, they are all in the non-food consuming uh, uh, biomass. So if you can compare that, then you can see that the freezing point, as well as the thermal stability, the viscosity, et cetera, they are quite comparable. And so they can be used as a drop-in fuel. So that is a very, very important property. If you cannot use them as a drop-in fuel, then you will have to change the engine and then you will have to you know, have a tremendous amount of investment. So yeah, any, any time you change an engine, even an automobile, it is a $1 billion, $1 billion investment. And it depends on the size of the auto automobile. And similarly, you know, if you change the engine in, a, in an aircraft, it could be a several billion dollars of investment. So now you can also see that what is the effect on a blend. So you can have a biofuel blended with the jet fuel and again, you can see all these properties, freezing point, thermal stability, et cetera. And these blends also work quite well. And so they have a similar drop-in fuel type of uh, property, but they have an advantage. If you have a blend, then you can, because the energy density in terms of the volume, as well as in terms of the weight is such that you can go a larger distance if you have a blended fuel. Otherwise, we know that if you have a pure need biofuel, then the range is uh, less because the biofuel requires a larger area to store in the aircraft and as well as it has a lower energy density and also requires a larger volume. So now there have been a lot of experimental flights using biofuels and you know I again want to mention the spice jet flight that was mentioned for a very short distance but it turns out that people have been going through this and they found that the biofuel particularly the blend 
have been very successful and so they can be replaced and some airlines like air new zealand and japan airline and and etc they have committed that in a matter of another 10 years they will completely go by the route of biofuels and completely uh, and completely eliminate the use of the uh, jet fuel but i think that in the near future they will go primarily with the uh, with the combination that is a blend because i think the blend as i said has a better properties and biofuel i think if you want to use it to cross atlantic for example or cross the pacific ocean if you want to go to los angeles to sydney you really cannot operate in biofuel that is quanta airlines which is a australian line they determined that you cannot cover a, you know 14000 miles uh, or suppose you want to go from chicago to new delhi it is not feasible with the current aircraft and current engines because the range that is available for these air, uh, for these fuels is small so now i will uh, try to address the other fuels and these are basically in a research state uh, you know these aircrafts uh, are not have been built and there are very major issues in doing that and one is the lng and another one is the hydrogen but you know they have a lot of potential in terms of having a less emissions lng is going to have emissions but much less compared to conventional jet fuel and hydrogen is completely emission free so you can see the energy per weight the energy per volume which is also very important and the storage temperature so you can see that lng is actually better in terms of the per weight but is not as good as in terms of volume but is quite comparable but the hydrogen is much better in energy per weight in terms of megajoule per kg but per volume you know it is really poor so for a hydrogen you would need a very large storage to carry a certain meaningful distance in the air transportation now storage temperature is also issue so you know they have to be stored and these storage tanks have to be there on the airport so that they they can be then refilled and the, the aircraft can be filled with these kind of fuel so you can say they see that the conventional jet fuel is minus 40 degree centigrade or higher the lng is even much lower temperature and the hydrogen is a very very lower temperature for the liquid hydrogen and this is also liquid lng which is primarily methane so this is a, as i said a no aircraft has been built so far using lng but this is a very good concept and so the boeing has come up with this kind of a artist picture that and so you can see at the bottom there is a fuel tank and this is a very huge fuel tank um, to, for to carry a certain number of passengers so there are various configurations that have been designed and these are all paper studies and to take into account that how to can accommodate for a certain range let us say for a range of about 500 nautical miles that will be required in terms of the storage using lng and of course there are other issues also you know that they, they have some very good properties you know like in terms of the freezing point etc you know they are as comparable as jet fuel so the properties are very good the problem is that how do you design them properly and then of course all the safety issues are involved and what is will take and also as i said the the cost involved in launching such a aircraft is very high so what you will do is that you take existing aircraft and see how you can modify it and of course and the other factor is very important that whether the current engines which are the gear uh, turbofans or which i mentioned to before which have a high bypass ratio whether they can be used effectively to get the lng operating but certainly the paper study show that they will lead, lead to substantial reduction in the in terms of the uh, emissions so now in terms of the, yes okay so in terms of if you look at the lng uh, cost versus the uh, cost of the current jet fuel is a substantially lower and this will keep on going down so that is a big advantage also in terms of using the lng so these are some of the properties of the fuel burn of jet fuel and lng aircraft and because i do not have time so i will cannot go over it but i would suggest to you uh, to mention to you that the lng uh, based aircraft has a slightly lower emission than in case of the the uh, the uh, standard jet fuel and these are shown by the red percentages and of course the engine is a very important problem so as you can see that the lng aircraft will require a lot of modifications to the engine so you will have to use aft fan you will have to use unducted fan and so on so forth 
So if, if, if this uh, engine change and as well as the change in the aircraft design, I think we are currently the paper studies and, but you know, I do not know how long it's going to take before they become really meaningful in terms of the air, actual aircraft in the near future. So actually in the near future, I think that the aircraft which are based on the standard biofuels will be the most, the most used ones. Now this is about the NASA the liquid hydrogen. These are again paper concept. The Airbus has shown the two different concepts of the, uh, the uh, hydrogen powered aircraft. And the hydrogen power, you know, this is the question I asked Dr. Malhotra. They are very important, uh, very, very critical issues. And the one is that how do you generate the hydrogen? So there are two methods basically. One is the electrolyzer, or that is electro electrolyze the water, and then you need the electrolysis. And this is not a very easy job. It requires a tremendous amount of investment and cost. How do you electrolyze the, uh, the water to create hydrogen? And then of course, where do you store the hydrogen in the liquid form? So those are very, very critical issues. Now the issue that I also raised was, that the other, uh, which is an easier process is that you can use the steam forming of the hydrocarbons. And these hydrocarbons are very easily available. But then you generate about eight to 10 kilogram of CO2 for every kilogram of extracted hydrogen from the hydrocarbons. And what, uh, so what do you do with the CO2? So his response was that you can take that CO2 and then you can create uh, chemicals. And that is absolutely true. But the thing is that the, you have to have a really, a, a, complete understanding and that's what also he mentioned is that somebody in academia should do the entire life cycle analysis so that it is cost effective. But right now our analysis and my analysis has shown that particularly for aviation, the process of using hydrogen by using the steam forming, we are generating a lot more CO2 and where are we going to uh, release that CO2? Because all these things have to be done very close to the Air Force. So I think that that is not feasible for aviation. So in the foreseeable future, the use of hydrogen as aviation fuel is very unlikely, although theoretically studies will continue. But what we, have, we find is that if you are very creative, then you can use the electrolysis. And that is what I am actually studying right now, along with the, some people with a Boeing and a small company. And so there are some, a company known as New Scale, and they have created a, some very, very small scale nuclear reactor, and they are not very expensive. So these nuclear reactors can be installed at the airport and the fuel depots would, and they can be generated uh, used to electrolyze the water. And so that is study is still being made and actually, you know, we will complete in a, about a year for the entire study. And we found that one of the existing aircraft configurations that was built by Boeing some years back, which is shown here, can be a useful configuration because what you can do is that you can store the hydrogen near the wing tips or under the belly of the aircraft. Now, all these studies have to be made that how much modification will be required and then, you know, what will be the cost of that modification, what will be the cost of the hydrogen generated by the nuclear reactors. So all these things have to come together and then it has to make economic sense. But what will happen is that if that is feasible and that has the economic sense and somebody is willing to launch it, this will be completely emission-free aircraft, zero emission. So that is a very, very major driver in terms of this kind of approach. But LNG doesn't have that potential or even the blend of LNG with hydrogen doesn't make sense because there are a lot of issues in terms of the use in the aviation. So now the, I will take another few minutes and I think you can take my time off from the question answer period. No, so sir. Now, Electric aviation, we can discuss in the question yeah, answer session. Just give, me, just give me five minutes, okay? Not more than five minutes. So the electric aviation, it is a beauty, a battery and fuel cell. And I am showing you that I think this is a tremendous potential, particularly for short haul going, you know, say like say 100 miles or 200 miles. And they will be basically driven by the uh, fuel cells or by the battery. Now, but for a long haul, I think it's going to be difficult to do that. So already actually the, some aircrafts have been built and they have been demonstrated for a nautical miles about 300, but they are only not more than four passenger and to two passenger aircraft. And so their requirements are small in terms of the weight of, that is required in terms of the batteries. And so what I'm showing you here is 
they the these are the hydrogen fuel cell based so you have a hydrogen fuel cell which i think is much more effective than the current status of the battery technology so i will show you some of the work that i have done i wanted to show you at least one uh, you know uh, electric uav in which we have worked uh, which has a propeller driven uav and in this we have used the battery and so we have found that you can of course have a zero emissions and if you fly uh, you know these are basically for reconnaissance flights at a lower altitude so about 10000 feet so these have a tremendous potential in terms of the research and in terms of you know in the potential for using a completely emission free applications and i know that some places in india also are involved in the uav and they are considering the you know basically the battery powered or the hydrogen fuel cell powered uav so i have tried to give you a overall complete view of what is going what is happening right now in terms of the current state of the art in the aviation fuels and what is the future that people are studying primarily paper studies and like lng and the hydrogen but i think that my understanding today is that the biofuels uh, whether they are blended i most likely blended biofuels uh, be they 80 to 20% bio blend or it could be 50 50 blend they are going to be the wave of the future for the existing aircraft and that will be the case for at least 50 years to come the other one is for the short haul that is a drones you know in the local environment or even you know going for a distance of say 100 miles or so or maybe even 250 miles or 300 miles you know for a for you know like for example even i think uh, considering a flight from delhi to bombay or delhi to bangalore it may be feasible to have a hybrid aircraft in which you have a certain amount of biofuel along with certain amount of hydrogen based uh, fuel cell so again it will on the net will reduce the uh, reduce the uh, emissions and also it may be feasible to use the existing aircraft because you can have a mix of the biofuel and the hydrogen to make it possible or if you use the hydrogen fuel cell in addition then i think that you can use the, some other interior needs uh, of the electrification the aircraft for that purpose so again thank you very much for your attention and you now we will then discuss you know during the question answer if you have any questions okay thank you sir so now we can move on to the professor nirend nath mustafi who is working as a professor at rajshahi university of engineering and technology bangladesh his research interests are the dual fuel engines they are experimental as well as simulation studies biomass gasification and energy conversion waste to energy energy efficiency and study of energy systems so i request professor mustafi to start his talk related with biogas um, thank you uh, moderator can you hear me yes yes sir yeah so uh, thank you again and also i would like to thank uh, professor avinash agarwal uh, to uh, give an opportunity to speak in this great event so may i sh share this slide uh, can you permit me to share my slides uh, screen hello sir you can see so slides are not visible sir okay yeah i am trying to share okay uh, okay Uh, why i don't know uh, sir please click on the share screen and there yes, is yes yeah. but uh, why i don't know why it is not your browser is hmm? i don't know why it is not uh, showing uh, some problem with I think I sent you the uh, slides. Okay, sir. Uh, we will check. We are checking. And, uh, 
No. Sir, can you please resend that file or confirm which email address you have sent? Yes. So till now we were uh, listening uh, uh, from different experts, uh, basically on liquid uh, fuels, liquid alternative fuels. So now I'll be talking. I'll be emphasizing the. Um, gaseous alternative fuel i will be talking on biogas or biomethane as a potential future alternative fuel for transport sector uh, it's already mentioned many times the transport sector is the world's second largest energy consumption sector and heavily reliant on uh, petroleum fuels and therefore the uh, petroleum demand for this sector is enormous and which is increasing and uh, uh, looking at this graph, we can have an idea. So by 2040, uh, the demand will be uh, like 151 quadrillion BTU. And the immediate uh, concerns are the uh, emissions uh, as well as the reserves of the petroleum products. Mm -hmm. So looking at the CO2 emissions, we can have a, uh, have a look at mm -hmm. CO2 emissions from the road transport, uh, basically the major share from the road transport. And uh, the, uh, to, to take uh, initiatives for to control these emissions, uh, so stringent emissions have been imposed throughout the world, like uh, those are basically Euro 6 level, and also there are international agreements where countries have signed uh, uh, to reduce their emissions to a certain level. So uh, these have been discussed uh, many times uh, today. There's uh, alternative fuels. Uh, we have to be, um, we have to look for alternative fuels and obviously biofuels are the major uh, uh, components, major elements. So these are all sorts of biofuels like biodiesel. Those so slides are still not visible. Okay. Slides are not visible. So something is, uh, the, the message is, browser is preventing access to your slide. Why it is not sure? So we are sharing from our system. Just a just few seconds. Yeah, I think that will be good. Yeah, so now it's visible, please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next, please. Uh, next, next, next. Yeah, uh, I was talking on this slide. So the all sorts of biofuels, uh, the measure is the biodiesel and then bioalcohols, uh, hydrotreated vegetable oils, DME, uh, biomass to liquid, but I will be emphasizing the biogas one. So other uh, um, technologies, uh, other ways to control these emissions, uh, we have to be relied on uh, new and innovative vehicle technologies, uh, including uh, obviously if you uh, consume less, then you contribute to the reduction of emissions. So higher fuel economy will be a one area. Then you have flexible fuel vehicles, those will be uh, for adapting alternative fuels and of course the emerging combustion technologies, combustion control, these are known as low temperature combustion engines, ACCI, RCCI, PCCI and gasoline compression ignition engines. These are uh, the merging together the benefits of SI and CI uh, engines and therefore you, have, you can have uh, diesel-like or even more than diesel-like uh, diesel efficiency with the uh, less emissions. So, and uh, gasoline compression ignition in this here, you have an opportunity to utilize uh, low-grade uh, hydrocarbon fuels. So, and then of course, uh, we have improved after treatment systems that, that will be continuing in a research area. 
And finally, we have electric vehicles, uh, perhaps better uh, future fuel market for hydro, um, hybrid electric vehicles and uh, plug-in electric vehicles, fuel cell electric vehicles, uh, uh, and then hydrogen uh, IC engine vehicles. Uh, but of course, the hydrogen generation and other issues are there. Uh, please, next, please. So then why biogas? Uh, the most attractive thing for biogas is that it can be generated from any organic wastes. Look at this uh, picture. So all sorts of wastes uh, developed from human activities. So uh, animal excreta and then sewage sludge, waste treatment, wastewater treatment plant. And of course, uh, we have MSW, feed wastes and energy crops. So any organic wastes can be converted to biogas. That's the most interesting thing. And then we have some process pretreatment, and then you have biogas digester where these uh, organic wastes will be decomposed uh, with this uh, absence of oxygen. Uh, yeah. So MSW is the uh, major waste uh, globally. So about 50% of the total waste generated globally is MSW. So, and then if you look at the content of the MSW, about 46%, even higher in some Asian countries, organic waste is there. So that is a, has a tremendous potential. And uh, as long as human being uh, are there, animals are there, uh, your waste generation will, con will be continued. So this is renewable. So this picture shows that there's a per capita waste generation throughout the world and uh, annually. And uh, obviously, <clears throat> USA is the topmost in this list. As the economy goes down, the waste generation also goes down. So uh, how to take care of this? If you don't take care of this uh, uh, organic waste for, from MSW, it will otherwise release methane to the atmosphere, which has a, uh, a very high global warming potential compared to the uh, CO2, for example. So the wise uh, uh, decision, the, if you con convert this uh, through an anaerobic digestion to useful byproducts uh, like energy, as well as the biofertilizer. Uh, next, please. So this picture actually uh, interprets the biogas production yield uh, from the different feedstock materials. Um, uh, look at this, uh, the highest yield comes from the grain or energy crops and somewhere uh, 70 to 75 <coughs> cubic meters per ton of fresh feedstock for MSW. Next, please. And look at the constituents. Uh, the methane is the main component, as we all know. It can vary depending on the feedstock you are using. Uh, feedstock using for this purpose. So this is the this is the table shows that the global potential for biogas uh, generation. So the two categories: uh, one comes from the energy crops, and other comes from the uh, wastes. So getting together, we have a huge, uh, enormous potential around 35.9 petazole uh, wall potential and very uh, less amount have been so far explored. So the huge potential is there. Next, please. Now, biomethane, what is biomethane? If you remove the, uh, looking at, looking back the uh, uh, constituents, other than methane, other components, other elements are non-fuel elements, basically. So you can, if you can remove the, uh, those uh, non-fuel elements, the biogas will be enriched uh, by methane, and then it is known as biomethane. So typically it contains 90%, but it can also contain 96 to 99% methane. So therefore, if you enrich methane, uh, then you have uh, enhanced energy value compared to raw biogas. This table actually uh, compares if you, uh, between this raw and uh, purified. So about 66 or 70, 67% higher energy content you can expect in biomethane for one, one meter cube. So the raw biogas, sorry, raw biogas, previous slide please. 
Raw biogas directly can be used for heat and power generation, but for the sophisticated uh, device like IC engines, you don't uh, use directly because you need uh, purified uh, biogas. Uh, uh, because you need energy density, ener enhanced energy density, as well as heating value, and also to make it corrosion free because H2S, the component, is responsible for corrosion. And also, you need to compress highly uh, to put into the cylinders, uh, and that is why you need to uh, remove the CO2 component, for example. Next slide, please. Uh, the major technologies are available commercially to remove those uh, unwanted impurities. For example, A2S uh, technologies are available even you can list, you can reduce them even less than one ppm. And water uh, also is very simple. You can use silica gel or aluminum oxide. Next slide, please. Now the major component CO2 uh, has to be removed. Uh, that is a major issue. So. Uh, as I mentioned already, technologies are available, matured, commercially available. You can purchase systems like uh, two, basically two categories, adsorption uh, type and absorption type. So these are the common, uh, most uh, common uh, methods, pressure sewing, adsorption, water scrubbing, physical organic scrubbing, amine scrubbing, and separation by membranes. Next slide, please. Uh, this uh, next few slides actually presenting the schematic. I'm not going into details, but the water scrubbing, you can have a look. You, you, your raw biogas is flowing off and the water shower from upside, uh, from upper side to going to down. So I'm not going into details into this uh, explaining. So next slide, please. This is water scrubbing. This is uh, pressure, uh, pressure swing adsorption, several units parallelly connected. Uh, the chemicals are there which absorb this uh, CO2 and then pure methane will come out from the top. Next slide, please. This is membrane separation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is the comparison table. So uh, here we have these parameters based on which you can compare all the methods available uh, for CO2 removal. So if you have this uh, table in hand, you can uh, consult with the table and looking at the parameters, which one will be suitable for you, uh, you can uh, select. So uh, it's energy. Uh, so looking at this cost comparison, okay, next slide. Uh, looking at the cost comparison uh, for biogas upgrading means CO2 removal. Uh, as I mentioned already, the water scrubbing method as the uh, has the minimum upgrading cost. Uh, here, this is this picture is actually taken from Sweden scenario. They have two different locations, water scrubbing in Greenland and water scrubbing in uh, Melmark. But these are the lowest cost for this uh, biogas upgrading. Now, biomethane production, uh, if you talk about the total cost, it has three components like biogas production cost and then cleaning and upgrading and also the distribution. So looking at this picture, you can uh, have an idea. So if you, are, if, if you are scaling up your production, then you are minimizing or reducing the cost. So uh, and also come, with, with this figure, we can understand this uh, manual or waste. Uh, if you generate biogas from these two sources, the cost will be minimum compared to the energy crops. Next slide, please. Now this picture actually tells us uh, uh, how the biomethane in terms of energy carrier. So the top most, uh, top three, actually the biofuels, basically they're liquid, just like bioethanol, biodiesel, rapeseed oil, and the lower uh, four are from biomethane or biogas. So if, if you look at the uh, mileage, for example, so highest mileage you can expect from biomethane. This is one hectare of corn equivalent uh, amount of uh, oil equivalent. This is as this has been explained here. So, compared to other biofuels like bi liquid biofuels, biomethane will have higher mileage. Uh, we can see from this picture. Next, please. Now, if you have biomethane in your um, uh, already produced, then you, you want to use in your existing vehicles. So, we have two gasoline vehicles and diesel vehicles. If you use gasoline vehicles, we have two methods, like if you, you, you can use either biofuel method or gas only 
mode. Biofuel means uh, with the existing gasoline uh, fueling system, you, you, you will add another uh, fueling system for biomethane. But this gas only mode is the dedicated engine uh, for biomethane. So uh, for biofuel, there is a flexibility. You can actually switch over from one to other. Like you, you can run on gasoline only or uh, or biomethane only. Diesel uh, fuel, sorry, back please. Uh, in, the, in the diesel vehicles, uh, the mode is dual fuel. So you, in, uh, the, you inject in, in the port of a diesel engine, uh, biogas, and as uh, existing diesel injection will be there. So in this method, about 60 to 65 percent diesel can be replaced easily. And also it has the flexibility uh, to switch over only, hydro, only diesel mode under operation. So this has been taken from uh, ARENA report 2018. Uh, this picture actually uh, tells us compared to all sorts of biofuels and alternatives uh, and also the conventional, how the biomethane perform in terms of CO2 reductions. Looking at these three bar, green bars, uh, up to 80% is possible to uh, reduction possible in the uh, greenhouse gas or CO2 emissions compared to gas which is 164 uh, gram CO2 equivalent per kilometer. Next slide, please. Uh, looking at the other emissions, um, uh, NOx and PAs uh, is drastically reduced if you use uh, biomethane. The black one is biomethane. Next, please. Uh, some of these successful stories, uh, like Sweden, which is the leading country, their capacity is increasing 20% per year, and uh, they have 655 city buses, which has 51,000 tons of CO2 reduction they have already achieved. And also, the, in the, there is a city, Linkoping, uh, which is the first biogas-based train they have in, uh, launched in 2005. Next, please. Uh, in other parts of the world, in Norway, uh, we have uh, we can see this is a ship running in hybrid mode, and biogas is uh, one of the fuel. Uh, in France, buses are uh, operating. In UK, buses are operating, and in the US, in different states, biomethane projects have been going on. Uh, next, please. Now, Indian perspective, uh, in 2005, Ministry of Road Transport and Highways, uh, Government of India introduced uh, this uh, CBG projects. Uh, about 5,000 CBC plants uh, will, uh, are to be built by 2023. Uh, and uh, 15 million tons of uh, compressed biogas uh, are as a target annually. Uh, and then next, please. Some of the uh, barriers can be identified as because a biomass feed stock is decentralized. Uh, Co-generation has been recommended. Uh, and then high cost of biomethane, we have seen so the total cost is uh, there. So it's a major concern. Awareness among the people, politicians, uh, researchers, and the users uh, vehicle uh, are important. There's a lack of awareness are there. And uh, infrastructure may be a problem where gas uh, grid or gas filling station are not there, but the existing um, infrastructure where it is existing, there's no problem. Um, technical limitations uh, in terms of driving lanes uh, and the in a carrier because it needs uh, a cylinders to carry on board that will that create another problem. Uh, next, please. So the recommendations uh, in terms of uh, the barriers, uh, co-generation or co-digestion uh, can be recommended. Uh, government should offer some economic incentives in short-term subsidies. Uh, these are the listed uh, incentives taken example from uh, already uh, using this technology in their country, like from Sweden, we can uh, take these examples. Respective authorities should arrange necessarily campaign programs because we have seen the lack of awareness is there, why biogas potential is not explored yet, so awareness is the, should be proper. And then policies and measures should be adopted stimulating biogas as the vehicle fuel as a green transport. Uh, next, please. Setting up rules and regulations uh, is important. 
uh, with the existing natural gas grid and incorporating private sector entities uh, to scale up biogas biomethane technologies. Formulating national policy is important. Adequate research and development to minimize the production cost should be there. And of course, this uh, liquefying uh, bio biogas um, or biomethane it should be encouraged. Next, please. So the conclusions, biogas or biomethane can be regarded as the most accessible energy uh, worldwide since it is derived from waste. Hence, the uh, use of biogas or vehicular applications is highly promising. So far, its utilization uh, based on European countries, but uh, due to availability of various biomethane schemes there, many commercial biogas <coughs> in European countries are available. Countries which already have natural gas grids and use natural gas vehicles are in advantageous position. Necessary initiatives and efforts are therefore required for the government, private bodies, as well as from the uh, waste treatment management systems. So this is uh, the ending of my talk. Thank you for your uh, attention. So thank you, Professor Mustafi. So this brings us to the end for the opening remarks. But now we have a lot of very interesting questions. And I hope like panelists will not mind extending this session a little longer so that we can respond to all the collected questions. So. Uh, maybe I can start with Professor Agarwal. So there is one question that he was talking about. The storage density of the aviation fuels. So all the liquid fuels, what he mentioned, they are oxygenated. So there are any options being considered who do not contain oxygen that, so that it does not adversely affect the storage part. Sir, please unmute, Professor. Yeah. Okay, this is a very good question, and I think uh, it is uh, asked by Gautam. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, so I think that this is not only a problem with the uh, the aviation, but also is problem with the uh, ground vehicles, and so the 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 all the biofuels uh, compared to let us say the petroleum based or the gasoline that we use, they all have this difficulty that they have a lower volumetric and gravimetric energy. And I pointed out, you know, during my presentation, and so it turns out that the, the, the issue is that, you no, know, that if you want, that what is your objective? So our objective is to cover, let us say the same, range and the same passengers and so on and so forth, and you want to have the same weight, uh, then, you know, it, it is going to be difficult because in order to cover the same range with the same passengers and you have a given takeoff weight for the, uh, the given weight of the aircraft itself, which consists of its structure and seats, etc., then it turns out that you cannot cover that much range. So we have a biofuel because of the lower density both uh, in terms of the space as well as in terms of the parametric density, uh, you will have to cover a smaller range of the same size. Or you will have to expand the storage capability of the aircraft. So now, the second option is uh, not really feasible because that requires uh, a tremendous amount of investment. Anytime you have a modification of the aircraft, and that is why you see that we have all these in the aircraft industry is modification. You start with 737, which is a very popular aircraft. He also has a number of them. And so you start at 700, uh, 200 model, 300 model. Now it is 800 model. So they really make small changes. So you have a basic aircraft and then you start making small changes because if you try to make any major change in the fuselage, or in the wing, and that is where most of the fuel is stored, then you are asking for a major investment. And so what I think people are doing, that I gave you some examples, and I think in the future also that is going to be the case, that you will have a blend. So you have a blended fuel, so you will keep some jet fuel and as well as you know the biofuel, 
and then see you know that whether you can reduce the emission but it's still not compromise the range and not the number of passengers that are there on the boat and and also the other as, aspect is that whether it requires any change in the engine so turbo gear fed engine engine uh, that is the most promising right now in terms of noise signature and that is built by Pratt and Whitney it's a high bus uh, ratio engine whether if you you know have a you know large amount of uh, biofuel then you will have to do you have to do something uh, for example similar to the uh, similar to a car you have flex fuel if you have a 80 20 combination that 80 percent ethanol and 20 percent you know the regular uh, gasoline then you know that you have to do some changes to the engine and that is a major investment so i think that uh, the, the the test cases have been done and number of airlines which are committed to this. Here, New Zealand is one of them, Japan Airlines is the other one. And so also, you know, on what kind of range you want to go. If you want to go, as I told you, the Qantas in Australia, you know, they are all very <coughs> But they are not able to cover, you know, a large distance. Like, for example, you know, going from Los Angeles to Sydney or San Francisco to Sydney, that is one of their most widely traveled route. So I think yet that there is no one single answer to your question. And so you have to see that what are the constraints and what can be used. But it is clear that some blend of biofuel, the jet fuel will be used without actually modifying the space of the fuel tank or fuel storage area. And also, you know, without going to those routes which require almost you know, the complete depletion of the fuel uh, to cover that much of uh, distance. So I think that for a short haul, like you have 500 miles, 600 miles, or within India, I think that it can be used very effectively using, say, 737 or Airbus 320 that are most widely used in India that I have traveled. So I think that that is the scenario, and there is a so that is what is going to happen. Uh, now, if there is a launch of a new aircraft, then I think uh, it might be feasible. I don't see that is going to happen. I don't know whether I answer your question. This question was posed by Gautam, I think. And if anybody else has a comment on what I said, you know, I will welcome that. Okay. Sir, please unmute yourself. Yeah, so we can move to next question. So Professor Kirti Bhushan Misra has presented very nice methodology of correlating the pine fire for selecting the suitable sit in improver. So it has been asked, can he further elaborate how this pine fire characteristics are related with ignition delay and like more details about methodology, how they can be related with selecting the suitable ignition improver. All right, see, uh, what we are doing is not directly connecting everything with the pan fire experiment, but uh, just to get an idea about how these fuels in different proportion, when we blend them in different proportion, how do they burn under ambient condition? We know that uh, the free burning rate of any fuel is a function of heat of combustion and heat of vaporization. This theory basically fails when we go to the energetic fuels category. Okay, this is what we have learned over the years that uh, when you burn organic peroxide, and the example of one which I have discussed in my uh, talk, which was uh, dietert butyl peroxide, this basically does not fall into that category of uh, uh, common uh, understanding that it will be uh, only a function of heat of combustion and heat of vaporization. That's why it is called energetic because of its uh, OO bond and uh, the tendency to decompose under low temperature condition. So once we have a data set at the ambient condition of this fuel burning behavior, then what we do is we try to correlate what happens when we put them under pressure. 
okay so when we have the relation between ambient pressure and under different pressure burning behavior then we'll have at least a sort of ratio what can be the burning rate under pressure okay so this gives us an idea about yes uh, this combination of fuels can be effective when we use them in diesel engines so this is not the first uh, time that we are doing this but people have been using this uh, dtbp as c10 improver for a long time and uh, connecting each individual fuel or observing their behavior in the diesel engine is not possible therefore we have to we have to uh, somehow uh, know their behavior at the laboratory scale test setup under ambient condition and then that will form a little uh, fair basis to select uh, the different proportions out of those fuels so uh, this was the basis but there is no direct relationship between the pan fire burning behavior and c10 number okay so there is no uh, such uh, theory that we have deduced in our work it's just an just as an experimental setup to uh, get a prior idea about their free burning behavior okay thank you yeah so there is quest one question for professor yogesh sharma so despite of like all the technical challenges being solved for biodiesel production so particularly in india what are the barriers which are causing that it is not spreading at large scale Well, uh, see the methodology and technology for biodiesel production have already been established by now. There are some modifications each day going somewhere here in other parts of the world and different laboratories. These are at research levels, and this will keep going. You know, research keeps going all the time. If you look at the biodiesel production, we have got. Uh, two major uh, components there one is feed stock and another is catalyst so catalyst part of research is going on is catalyst uh, synthesis especially uh, synthesis and production of uh, heterogeneous catalysts for biodiesel production may there are various reasons obvious reasons for uh, application of uh, heterogeneous catalysts for biodiesel production then one thing which is left is uh, the other part that is feed stock material so answer to very uh, direct answer to your question is that it is basically feed stock material which is not available number one number two lot of research is yet to be done that uh, um, could uh, waste uh, frying oil that is the like focus of the global focus uh, as a feed stock material Uh, can it be collected and used in, in our country? So uh, you see, it, it, it could not pick up because of these reasons only. There are like reports that biodiesel is produced cost of cost also. The cost of feed stock material is, is not viable. There are some outlets in our country where uh, biodiesel is like uh, sold to customers, and then it, that is subsidized rate like government. the keeps it rate a rupee less than the rate of diesel but then it, it doesn't pick up because the cost has to be lesser and lesser it can pick up only when like the, the usual diesel is not available then you are left with nothing but this particular alternate only so this basically answer to your question is that it is feed stock which is not available and then uh, it is not uh, biodiesel as such is not available at outlets So this is answer to whatever you have asked me. Okay. So But thank I you. I have sir. a very, I have a very small question um, from Professor Mishra. Okay. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Professor Mishra, like it's a very interesting and important lecture uh, discussion you presented, and I thank you for that and congratulate you. But then my reservations are that uh, when we blend. these biofuels to uh, increase their c10 number uh, i think there would be uh, there would be an issue of uh, emissions you know 
different emissions would come up now we always talk of uh, carbon monoxide nitro nitrogen oxide sulfur oxide hydrocarbons but when we blend it with some materials so there could be some other emissions which may not be environmentally friendly and which could be like uh, affecting fauna flora everybody adversely uh i fully agree with you sir because uh, there are some additives which are lead based or some nitrogen based additives are also there which are which are ultimately prone to producing nox when they are getting combusted inside a confined space that's that's for sure uh knowing that we uh, did not at all select those additives because they also uh do not give us that combustion characteristics which we generally look for so this azo based compounds are not really uh, feasible for um, uh, ice the, therefore we have uh, chosen the fuels from a particular group of uh, organic peroxides and in that organic peroxides also we have wide variety of uh, chemical structure uh, having uh, different fuels so uh based on the burning behavior in ambient condition under ambient condition we observe how the flames look like is the flame producing too much smoke or is it too much luminous or it's producing too much uh, nox cox or uh, sox under ambient condition so that uh, basically forms a, a basis for us to choose a particular type of additive so this dtbp what i have uh, presented in my talk uh, has shown the best burning behavior least emission under ambient condition okay so that's why we picked up that and added in uh, different proportion in diesel as well as biodiesel together with methanol and ethanol to see uh, whether they are helping us to cut down the emission up to desired level thank you thank, thank you, you professor misra and there is one question for professor mustafi so how the different biomethane production technology means co2 removal can be compared and what are the possibilities for using the collected co2 um actually i i have shown a table uh, comparing these uh, different technologies for co2 removal Uh, looking at the uh, different options uh, water scrubbing method is the least cost method this is that's the most economical one and i think it's already in practice in even in india uh, there is a research on i think in iit delhi they have biogas uh, project and they have uh, purified by water scrubbing method so that water scrubbing is the easiest and the simplest and also also the most economical one and the co2 removed from this uh, uh systems um i think uh, there are letters are available how to take care of this uh, co2 but i have i'm shown in the, in my talk i'm i'm not included there but the letters are in letters are, it is available how to take care of this co2 it can be regenerated and for uh, can be used for chemical uh, useful chemical uh, purpose and from professor agrawal it has been asked what is the scope for liquid hydrogen and alcohol as alternate fuels for aviation sector sir please unmute huh. all right yes. so i think that liquid hydrogen uh, has a lot of potential and you know all its properties they clearly demonstrate that the liquid hydrogen of course is completely emission free and all the uh, changes that are required in terms of the engine uh, that are being used uh, i think that uh, yeah they, they are not going to be you know that substantial you know particularly in the combustor area now the problem with liquid hydrogen is that how are you going to generate it so that is a big point and i think that uh, there may be you know some thoughts about it now the bp recently the british petroleum uh, they have uh, you know come up with a solution that you know they are going to generate in a fashion that 
basically using the steam forming on the hydrocarbons and then the carbon dioxide that will be generated and there's a lot actually for one kilogram of a typical hydrocarbon uh, they will have to use, they generate about six to seven, you know, so every hydrocarbon will have a different, but it is about six to eight kilogram of um, CO2, which is a lot. So this was also mentioned, you know, by Dr. Malhotra, that you can take that carbon dioxide and you convert it into, say, other chemicals, or you can also use it in some situations, you know, for other enhanced methane recovery or enhanced oil recovery along with the CO2 sequestration. So there are a variety of ways you can use that CO2 and that is a much cheaper process. But uh, the, the some of the other viewpoint that I mentioned is that you can generate it by the splitting of water. Now splitting of water, you know, people have been trying, you know, for I would say 40, 50 years. And again, you know, once you split it, and of course the second aspect is which is true for every other technology, the storage of hydrogen. So one of the ideas that has been floating around that are, I've been looking at, you know, I would say for last year or so, is to use of the nuclear reactors and which, you know, you can have a nuclear power to split the water. And nuclear power we know is completely emission free because you, so that you don't have to that worry about the steam forming or other techniques to generate hydrogen. So there, there, so there are companies who are working at it with coming up with a, some a small size, very, very small size nuclear reactor. They're quite safe, as, as that is what is claimed. And they can generate sufficient hydrogen for the need for a certain amount, certain fleet of the, of the air vehicles. So I think that that is what I'm looking at as a, just a research project, which I mentioned. And there is a company name is New Scale. And a lot of uh, information is available if you Google it. So I think that uh, from aviation point of view and also uh, even for the ground vehicles, the hydrogen may come along, you know, but uh, I am not totally sure that how economical it will be. But uh, the, the point, uh, the, 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 uh, the chart I showed you that it is, it's uh, uh, the volume as, uh, is, a, is a problem, but in terms of the and the temperature is storage is a problem, but in terms of the weight, megajoule per kg, it is better than both li liquid natural gas as well as the jet fuel. So I cannot say that, you know, I, I think it has a good potential and that's why people are investing. Uh, British Petroleum is investing, you know, some other, uh, um, some other companies, you know, which are involved in the, uh, in the fuel sector are looking at seriously and there it may have some other applications as well. As far as alcohol is concerned, you know, alcohol is nothing but ethanol. And so it is like a biofuel, you can call it. And so how do you, uh, you know, blend the ethanol with a, with a existing jet fuel? And that could be true even for a, or for a car, you know, you can just, you know, push the, the, take the entire tank and put the ethanol and see whether you can use it. But if you have a hundred percent ethanol, I don't think the current engines will work. So you will require some modifications to the engines. Now, in case of uh, the, uh, the fighter aircraft, I think there was a question with Professor Avinash Agarwal, and I can answer that right now. And he, that was a very good question that he said that B-52, there is a, you know, which is a fighter aircraft, which was um, a bomber and which had a, a use of liquid hydrogen in 1960s. And, you know, that was actually uh, one of the experimental situation that was used. But there are two main issues. The issue with a commercial aircraft, which uses a gas turbine type of engine, versus the kind of engine that is used in the case of a fighter aircraft are very different. So there, if you can combust the hydrogen in a combustor, then I think you can you know, derive the required amount of thrust. So I think that that was tried, and I think that that forms the basis even today uh, to, to, to use that information and try to see how can you can use it for a fighter aircraft. So as a matter of fact, the fighter aircraft technology in terms of the engines and in terms of particularly, you know, covering the range from say Mach number of say 0. 0.6 to uh, Mach number of 0. 0.3 or so. It is not uh, uh, applicable to if you have a, a scramjet kind of very, very high Mach number flow. You know, we really don't know how to do that. So. 
I think that in that range, and also you see the fighter aircraft, the total requirements are very small in compared to the, uh, the other aircraft, and also the safety requirements are much more uh, smaller. So actually a lot of experiments that are being done in making aviation a lot more, uh, I would say, uh, energy efficient and also a lot more emission free. We always use a fighter aircraft as a, as a benchmark uh, place, but the engine is very different actually. And of course, a lot more money is available <laughs> to experiment for a fighter aircraft than to launch a, launch a commercial aircraft. But I do agree that they are not only this B-52, but you know, actually I showed in one of the slides in which British Petroleum has involved the AVI aircraft, which has already been built and flown uh, by, um, as a hydrogen powered aircraft. It's completely hydrogen powered. And so I think that uh, for a small haul uh, aircraft, um, you know, I think that the demonstration has been made uh, both for fighter as well as for a small passenger aircraft. So hydrogen has a tremendous potential. And, you, and alcohol, I think, as I told you, is a, is a big problem you know, that um, it will require, you know, we don't want to actually, uh, we want to drop in fuel and we don't want any modification to the engines. So, and also it has to have all the properties, you know, of, uh, of whether it freezes at high temperature and what is thermal stability and what is viscosity, et cetera. But I think alcohol is a good fuel. I mean, it will run, but as I said, you know, you cannot use it if pure alcohol for, uh, for running the, uh, running the, uh, running the uh, engine. But I do know that, you know, you know, actually it's a real case I am aware of that, uh, one of my friends actually got stuck and he's a really energy specialist while driving his car. And so he could not find a gas pump or anywhere, but he had a, you know, I don't know how, you know, he had some alcohol bottles in his car. And so he just plugged the alcohol bottle. He thought that it will run and it, it, it refused to run. And so actually he damaged the engine more than he, he anticipated. <laughs> It cost him a lot of money to actually clean and over all the engine. So that is my uh, my view on you know both the questions. I don't know whether I I have answered properly, but I think that that is all I know about you know the situation. Thank you, sir. So one very interesting question for Professor Kirti Bhushan Mishra. So based on the additive approach you are suggesting for making fuels better. So can you think of something which can make methanol combustion in engines safer, especially from the perspective of the flame invisibility and like a smaller ignition delay? Uh, yes, I, uh, I can say that uh, our recent investigations have shown that uh, uh, adding gasoline in small quantities in methanol uh, can make the flame bit uh, bit luminous and uh, will solve the problem of uh, visibility. Uh, that is the part uh, of uh, uh, how we can you know uh, detect the flames uh, which are generally invisible in nature when we burn methanol alone. Uh, as far as the combustion is concerned, uh, methanol is a slow burning fuel. Even if you take it uh, in IC engine under high compression ratio, uh, you will definitely be requiring some, some sort of additives to speed up the combustion. Dimethyl ether is an option that can also be tested and he has given a lot of uh, uh, you know interesting uh, results in several measure. So with methanol, we are uh, ready with the results uh, of gasoline addition in different proportions and their burning characteristics under ambient condition. Now, uh, since we do not have that laboratory facility to test that in gasoline engines, then uh, therefore we cannot uh, say anything about what happens inside the engine with these blades. If the opportunity is given, we will definitely be uh, interested to test these blends also in the in the petrol engine and to see how uh, this uh, these blends are behaving okay so thank you professor misra and i would like to end this session by final concluding remarks from all the panelists and starting by professor ramesh agarwal so these two minutes you can use for answering any question or any final comments sir. professor agarwal 
Yeah, I really enjoyed, you know, the presentations. I think uh, I learned a lot, you know, about the amount of work that is being done by various researchers in terms of, you know, the various kind of uh, fuel plants and, you know, and I think it was very informative, particularly, you know, how they are addressing, you know, the needs, you know, that are, that are needed, you know, in India. So I think it was a really, you know, very nice and very, uh, uh, informative session, and I think uh, uh, the uh, the uh, presentation, you know, that by Dr. Mishra, you know, particularly as he was mentioning, I think that if he can, um, you know, that the the additive that he has added, I think it looks <laughs> really very promising, you know, and I, I was really impressed with that. But if you know, and there's a next step, as he was mentioning already, that he can um, figure out that how much blend of uh, methanol um, with the uh, gasoline uh, can be used in a IC engine effectively uh, and also how much will be the emission in that and then maybe he can add that additive that he's talking about uh, you know and speed up the uh, combustion process i think that it may have some impact and so i that is just a thought you know that after listening to his presentation because I think that that will have a lot of impact in the long run. But again, I enjoyed, uh, you know, the entire session. And um, I think um, it was worthwhile. And I want to again thank, um, you know, Professor Avinash Agarwal to persuade me to, to join this session. And I think it was worthwhile. And also Akhilendra Pratap Singh. And I want to thank you for moderating the session. Thank you, sir. So, Professor Yogesh Sarma, so any final thought? Just in yeah, one minute. I mean, many, lot, many thoughts. First thought, uh, see, I'm also uh, conducting one uh, international conference, 18th to 20th of December. So I had written a message late at that time there, so I will not be able to uh, the session. But then I thanked uh, Paul, insisted me to join this session. So I somehow came and made, make it possible to be there with all of and I really would have missed the greatness of Professor Agarwal, Professor K.B. Mishra, Dr. Malhotra, and uh, such a nice conduction of this uh, particular session by you, uh, Dr. Dhar. So I thank you very, very much. But then I have a very small like uh, question lingering in my mind about additives uh, in biofuels. So I also, it interests me also. Maybe I also get into this particular research. That to me, that if you add anything that has that has to that that has to have some consequences on the emissions. So my reservations are there. So that Professor Mishra, he has a good laboratory and he says he will be conducting a few things, few experiments on emissions. It is are there. I would also like to join you when I would certainly work on this particular area. After all, if you could uh, cut down the emission, that is so. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So, Professor Mustafi. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, it was actually a nice uh, session. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Abhinash Agarwal once again and also uh, Dr. Akhilendra Pratap Singh uh, because he uh, always maintained a good communication with us and then also. Uh, you as the moderator, it's a very kind session. And um, I have learned a lot, uh, particularly from uh, ranging from aviation fuels and then uh, biodiesel. And of course, uh, I will, I have emphasized the uh, biogas potential. So it was actually, it covered all uh, areas. I think uh, it was a nice session. Thank you for um, giving me an opportunity to join this session. So maybe Final thought from Professor Misra. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Dhar. Uh, well, I think uh, the organization, organizers uh, took uh, a great effort to organize this virtual event. Even in these crucial times when we are not able to connect with each other physically, then, then also we uh, have a chance to uh, get to know what we have done over the year. Okay, so uh, I, I really appreciate the 
uh, hard work put by all the members of engine research laboratory under the guidance of professor agrawal it's an excellent initiative i really enjoyed the presentations by uh, first of all uh, dr malhotra who guided us uh, for uh, what can be done in future to uh, overcome the fuel crisis and emission requirement so that was an excellent uh, introduction to this uh, particular session after that uh, professor agrawal really uh, uh, has some uh, rich out of his rich experience he gave us uh, certain uh, directions what uh, uh, we should do in uh, particularly in uh, picking up a particular type of fuel uh, after that uh, we have learned about the fed stock from uh, professor sharma from bhu so that was also an interesting thing for us because uh, being in engineering discipline we sometimes uh, overlook the chemistry part so it's uh, always good to have little bit of knowledge of chemistry also in the in the um, in one of the lectures in the session uh, after that uh, i i really uh, appreciate the lectures by uh, dr mustafi uh, where we learned how biogas can also be used uh, as a potential fuel for future so in a uh, nutshell i can say that it was uh, uh, it was a good combination of all the uh, demanding topics in this particular area of alternative fuels and excellently organized by uh, dr akhilan pratap singh and moderated by dr atul dhar once again thank you very much for having me here today and uh, i congratulate all the members of indian research laboratory especially professor agrawal and uh, i look forward thank to you, meet sir. again to all of you in next uh, event so thanks for making this session really wonderful by nice input and and i am sorry for the participants whose questions may not have been taken still like after 30 minutes delay 54 participants they are with us and i hope we have uh, collectively contributed something meaningful from this session with this note officially i am announcing the closure of this session and who want to discuss like of course unofficially it can continue for a minute thank you all right thank you all thank you thank you good night good night